Uh, good afternoon to all of you in the audience here and to the live streaming audience. I'm Terry Anderson. I'm the John and Jean Denault Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. That's the Hoover Institution in California, not the one that you're sitting in right now. Uh, uh, my, uh, my time at Hoover is uh, three months out of the year. I live in Montana the rest of the time. Uh, and. Uh, escape during March, April, and May when no one wants to be in the mountains where it's still snowing. Uh, the Hoover Institution is focused on uh, defining the ideas of a free society, and uh, that's really the topic of the discussion today uh, and uh, discussion that, that we are fostering at Hoover on renewing indigenous economies. I might tell a quick story. Uh, a week ago, we were at, at the Hoover Institution at Stanford, and we were uh, having a glass of wine in the courtyard after dinner, and a group from the Alumni Association came up and uh, said they, they were going to have a glass of wine in the same courtyard. Did we mind? And I said, of course, no, no problem. And they, they said, uh, who are you? And I said, oh, I'm Terry Anderson, senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. They said, oh, really? What are, you, uh, what are you here for? What are you studying? And I said, we're looking at renewing indigenous economies. I thought the person was going to fall over. Now, I think that I said something about we're trying to civilize indigenous economies. They would have said, yeah, that's what we would figure you bunch of right-wing nuts would do. Uh, but instead, when I said, explained what we were all about, uh, he was just flabbergasted that the Hoover Institution would be uh, undertaking such a project. But for me, to the contrary, the ideas defining a free society are, are the ideas that are lacking for indigenous people around the world, certainly indigenous people in the United States. So. Uh, to joining me today, uh, who, who know these issues far better than I do, are two gentlemen uh, who are, are heroes of mine, uh, both in slightly different contexts. One is Hernando de Soto, and I'll let Manny introduce him, and the other is Manny Jules. Uh, Manny, over here on the right, uh, is, uh, is the best storyteller I know, is uh, is the best indigenous leader I know. Uh, Manny is, is from Canada, from a First Nation in Canada, the Szechuap Band of Kamloops Indians. Uh, he's uh, chief of the First Nations Tax Commission. Uh, but most of all, Manny is a passionate, intellectual uh, tribal leader who, who understands, as I said, from living as a chief and living uh, on, on a reserve in Canada, understands better, better why we call it renewing, namely it's renewing because indigenous people around the world had vibrant economies. They, 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 they were economies that didn't just allow them to survive, they allowed them to thrive. And Manny has heard these stories uh, from the oral tradition in his tribe, his band, uh, and has uh, told them to me many times, and, and for that reason he is my hero. With that, let me turn it over to Manny Jules uh, uh, and uh, thank him for uh, all that he has contributed to my understanding of these issues. Manny. Thank you, Terry. Uh, when, when I first started thinking about a lot of the issues that confront uh, indigenous populations around the world and uh, thinking about the complexity, the, the fact that we've been colonized, we need in this day and age to sort of not roll back the clock because we can't, the, the Colombian exchange is a reality. Uh, all of us benefit uh, from the Colombian exchange. You can see tomatoes, you can see corn, all of those nice stuff in the, in the lunch today. Uh, but our histories are one of a proud people uh, that we were colonized and that took away so much of our jurisdiction from traditional times. And one of the gentlemen that uh, truly inspired me, and it is, it is, you know, you have to kind of think differently when you're confronted with the issues we're dealing with. And one of the issues that I think is part of the mythology is that we were socialist, that uh, all of the, everything that we ever owned was held in common, that we didn't have an economy that we didn't contribute, we didn't have trade. All of those notions are part of the mythology that we have to destruct. And it's creative destruction. 
We have to be able to deal with the past because it has to inform our future. And when we think about the future, we have to be absolutely fearless because it is only through being fearless will you ever make fundamental change. And so in that, I started to hear about a gentleman by the name of De Soto, not the conquistador, <laughs> but the economist. And what Hernando has been able to do, and, and the, I, his story is fascinating, of course Peruvian, but uh, started to understand, uh, traveled to Canada, his parents were involved in, in, as amb ambassadors, went to Switzerland, got his degree, went back home and realized my people live in third world conditions. Why did the West succeed when others haven't? And those examples and those teachings are what we face as indigenous populations around the world. And so what he's dedicated his life to, and believe me, when you think about principles and you think about philosophy, People have tried to kill this gentleman because of what he believes in. And when that happens, you believe, he, this, this guy believes in this. He's willing to put his life on the line for what he believes. And that is an incredible bravery. And so when I started to understand the philosophy that he espouses, and this notion that indigenous people didn't have private property rights, Believe me, if you ever went into somebody's teepee, you would know immediately who owned it. If you tried to put on my moccasins, you would know it only belonged to me. So it's within that context that the teachings of Hernando de Soto not only have applications here in the United States and in Canada and New Zealand and in Peru, but they're international lessons that we have to work towards. And when you face the uncertainty that our world has had to deal with since really, since time immemorial, but more recently, we've all been affected because of 9-11. That's a reality that we all deal with. It's changed our world fundamentally. And when you think about what we're trying to advocate as economists, as leaders, as indigenous people, it's trying to develop this concept of peace, order, and good government. And how do you transfer that knowledge? You do it through institutions. Because we all live here for a finite period of time, and we're all blessed because we've made that journey to this meeting today. And you're all honored to be able to hear the words of this wise elder. Fernando. Thank you so much, uh, Manny. Take away the elder sort of part. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I told Fernando, I Googled Hernando de Soto to see how old he was, and I found out he was born in 1571. I think. <laughs> well, uh, de Soto did come to try and look for the fountain of youth, and uh, we've been successful. <laughs> so, uh, uh, well, uh, we met with Manny uh, some time ago trying to... Uh, bring down an, uh, a tribal war in Peru, right? That started with Bawa, an oil company, and, um, and various tribes. There was about 38 deaths, and then the idea was uh, the, the message had come actually from Hugo Chavez, which he says, where he said, ethnically, we're not made for that. That came down through Evo Morales and Hugo Chavez, and the reply to that was, well, we've got uh, Manny Jules to prove that not everybody thinks that way, and he is a brother. And then you met all the other indigenous chiefs, and you said, you know, Manny Jules, Kamloops, and the other guys said chief people, and Kitchos. It was a wonderful occasion. And he went on Peruvian TV. It went around to all the stations, the filming we did. Somebody asked him, but wait a second, uh, what does this have to do with the ancestry, with, you know, what the Americas that they have been trampled uh, by all the successors of Christopher Columbus? And Manny comes out and says, uh, look, I may be indigenous, but I'm not a museum piece. And that started a whole bunch of stuff going on very, very nice. So anyhow, uh, what I've been doing is actually taking notes seriously while everybody else was discussing. Well, sorry about this, Manny. Manny was doodling, not really focusing. 
And uh, but it what reminded me of was uh, uh, was was th was this. I actually only come to Peru uh, about the age of forty. Most of it was in exile because of my pa my parents getting involved in politics, and uh, I was very curious to find out why things were the way they were. And something very important happened when we started working together uh, some time ago uh, at the Amazon. I think it was about eight years ago, yeah. could it be? Yeah. yeah. Well, the re uh, a the lot of it... The monk debates. Huh? The monk debates just before that. And then the monk debates just before. So that was monk debates, gold, <laughs> and all of that. And uh, all of a sudden I started saying, now here's the part that's interesting. The revolts in Peru, which have not ceased, nor in Bolivia, nor throughout the world, nor in Nigeria. And they're to testify to our, uh, the uh, um, Blood Diamonds and Avatar is uh, the people who go below the earth like the Morlocks in H.G. Wells' novels, the nice guys, blue-colored who are on top, the natives. And this always has been happening, but now they were at war. And I, try to figure it out. And again, of course, the issue of property came in. Uh, in our part of the world, uh, not only Latin America, but Asia, Africa, we don't have the Anglo-Saxon fee simple like you do. You, I mean, it's not full in the United States, but what, whether you are like, this betrays my age, like James Dean, who pumps <laughs> the oil and comes out bathed in black and says, I'm rich, because he's got that all the way down to halfway to China. Uh, generally, in the rest of the world, the subsurface belongs uh, to government. It's sovereign territory. That's what you've been talking about all day long, today's sovereign. And the sovereign owns uh, the land. That's why any time a foreign company or local company wants to dig further, they get a concession on sovereign land. The sovereign is the one who decides who gets the rights and doesn't get the rights. And it all comes back because nobody really thought about it that way. It's because when the Romans wanted to build the armor, they wanted to get the metal into place, and most of it was below the earth. They had to dig 20, 30 meters, so they went to war, captured slaves, and they did the digging. So that was sovereign territory, because nobody else could make slaves work in such quantity to dig it up, and it still stays with us. In the meantime, the Spaniards sent and the Brazilians sent to the topsoil all the indigenous people who then informally divvy it up among themselves or have some kind of a title that says it belongs to the community. <laughs> and usually then part of the thing is you go, if you're a company that extracts oil and, uh, or any minerals, now in Peru we know that we have the second most important uranium reserves in the world. We have the first in lithium. We're about going to be fourth in, uh, in uh, gold, but it is now being held up. Because, of course, you get the concession to the subsoil, but where are you going to install, unless you're Richard Branson out there in a balloon, where are you going to install your operations? Where are you, where are you going to drill? you got to drill from the topsoil. And before it was easy, you go, you talk to the tribal chief, you make a deal, make it easy for him, and you just keep on, you go and drill. But times have changed. Apart from Washington consensus, there's something else that's happened with all the people whose hearts were on the side of the underdog. It doesn't matter what. They formed the Geneva consensus. And that Geneva consensus has gone from uh, United Nations idea of an anti multilateral, uh, uh, multinational companies uh, organization all the way to. Uh, uh, a fair globalization by the United Nations joined with the ILO, all the way to Treaty 169, uh, which says that all people who are on the surface shall be consulted, the ecologists, the Rio Summit. In other words, 1989 did not only mark the fact that we who believe in markets took center stage, it's that the other guys didn't take center stage, but they also produced a consensus. Let's call it the Geneva Consensus. And it has trickled down over time, and we've studied it you know, year after year, and it's trickled down through the twists and turns of interpretations. Now, literally, by law, in my country, and we're confirming in other countries, we started consulting about this, you and I, it is no longer do you consult with people to say, how happy are you? Is this all right? Should we put the mill here and put it there? 
you need an authorization of the indigenous people to drill. And they are in full conflict with, with mining and oil companies in 248 places in Peru. And they're blocking, and the other places where they're not in conflict, just if you can't invest, you don't want to invest, why should you fight? They're blocking $800 billion worth of oil and uranium and lithium, name it, in Peru. Worldwide, it's $150 trillion on which on the surface sit poor people, many, of course, indigenous, and below the, the, the surface are things that are being concessioned to large foreign companies who are the inheritors of the Romans and who have got <laughs> possibility of digging. So how do you get out of this? Because when you go and you find out where are the registers or ledgers that uh, the terrorists in Peru, in Colombia, uh, enforce at gunpoint, they're right on top, whether it's called ISIS, Al-Qaeda, FARC, or um, a Shining Path, or whatever. In other words, they have understood that uh, as opposed to the states where, you know, any James Dean can come around and dig it up. The, if you own the top, it's like a Coca-Cola bottle. You own the whole Coca bottle, you know the Coke, but the guy who can unscrew it has got power, according to law that is 3,000, 2,400 years old. That's where the stuff comes in. So that's where we've gone in, uh, we, we've started getting involved. And uh, you know about it because you've met them. We've now more or less got organized, as far as you can get the informal sector organized, 400,000 informal miners of Peru. Mm -hmm. The formal miners, that is to say, those that work for a company and get a salary, formal in that sense, and are therefore working for the guys who get concessions in the subsoil, uh, those are 200,000. Those who can't get the concessions to the subsoil, because it's a monopoly. Once you get a concession, it's all yours, mm -hmm. and you have to bribe. So there's supposedly the free market, but when they get below your cellar, and you go, knock, knock, who's there? And you only have one company to deal with. It requires bevies of lawyers that come in. Now, um, the story gets a little bit more complicated. Because now they're not only blocking you from coming in, they're taking over mines, or let's say, the, let's put it this way, mineral deposits, oil, gold especially. Uh, the gray economy produces about 40% of Peru's gold. Uh, and uh, take a company like, I mean, I'll be really concrete about this, take a company like Newman Mining. Today, the world's, uh, they've now passed the Barrick, the Canadian company there. Yes. They're ahead. And uh, they come in, they do everything by the book, ecology, what you should do. They've got there, they've got the, the title to the concession, shall we say, and the right to own the mineral once it's gone out of the surface. And they've gone to the people on top of the surface. They've consulted with the authorities of the indigenous groups where there are indigenous groups or loggers, whoever's there, they bought them parcel by parcel according to the rules that they've set out themselves. And then all of a sudden, some people appear and they say, you've been talking to the wrong people. We're the guys who run the surface and according to the law. So then we started finding out, this is interesting, we started getting into an association with an American company to say, yes, of course, nobody's got a map if we really on the surface of the whole third world. You got Google Maps that tell you where every river is, you got where every forest is, where every building is, but nobody tells you who really controls it. I mean, do you think it's like the states? This is, uh, this is uh, Louisiana, this is this, uh-uh. It says Peru, but who controls Peru? And Africa, go find out. And you know, why can't we get these guys from the Islamic State? Go find them keep on dropping bombs. Well, how many bombs did Obama drop last 2016? 25,600 in different countries. You can't find them. You must be, I mean, if you have to drop 2,600 them, you're having trouble finding them. <laughs> While ISIS does know where they are. So it's very important to know who's where, even seen from the point of view of a um, company that 
is in the extractive business. Especially since in a developing country, I mean, my country, uh, the, part, the property rights on the extraction side are much more important. 80% of our exports come from the, say it's the Persian rug, come from the parts where the knots are. Every, the asparagus, all these things that we've given the world, tomatoes, corn, etc. That's 20%. What's really important is who holds on, and that's very well mapped out, as it should be. So the question then becomes, uh, what do we do about this? And we then start seeing that these Peruvian organizations on the top are not being punished. The last time uh, we ever blocked an American investment, which was back in the 60s, that belonged to uh, International Petroleum Company, which is New Jersey Standard Oil, we got really badly punished. They cut off funds, they cut off aid, it really hurt, and the government just had to pay. But this time that wasn't happening. Why wasn't it happening? Because the organizations on top didn't challenge the title. They said, you got your title. And uh, of the subsurface. And the guys, as far, and all the properties that, or parcels that were brought on the surface, they didn't challenge them. So here's Newmont Mining. It's got its titles. So what did they take away? What they took away was basically trust which was what Andrea Lisse was talking about. They basically, they didn't realize, they still haven't fully realized it, but we did realize it. It is that what really was interesting for, aside from taking out the gold, of course, was really interesting for um, uh, this company was taking all the fact that it had complied with due process, and now it was in control of the ore, and then take it to the securities exchange to go then to the market to raise capital, right? They had to prove in a certain way that the titles could now function not as titles of owning the earth, which is what you've been concerned about all morning, which we now for Peruvians of the mining corporation, just the first investment is only 5% of the value of the mine. The earth is only 5%. What was interesting is the other 95%. What's the other 95%? It means that they go and they have to get an underwriter and before they can make a public offering, they've got to follow a series of procedures. The date back to 1933, the Securities, the Securities Act, 1934, the Securities Exchange Act, even sarbanes Oxley talks about what they have to comply with. Not one word about property rights yet. It's all about checking whether you got the property rights or you don't. But not one word, because they don't pretend to get into land titling. That's left for you kind of guys who are concerned about Earth and not about property, and cannot make a distinction between property and sovereignty, and you're going to not make it until you make that distinction. Sovereignty is whether you rule the place. Property is whether you can move it. And if you move it, that's when you start making money, but then you could lose it. There is a price for that. Sovereignty means that you've got what our indigenous people have in Peru, absolute sovereignty, but no money. So. It's a good idea to find out how these, these two things come together. You can have the rules, and you can have the property, but whoever is going to buy from you wants to make sure that when you pass something over, it stays with them, and it commits you, and that you put some skin in the game. But let's go back to the Securities Exchange Commission. So then I go off, and I say to some people in the States, you know, this is really interesting. Uh, Basically, what we're starting to find out is that the people who own the topsoil, and we're not going to change 2,400 years of Roman law. That's just not going to happen overnight. What do we do? Why can't we do the following thing? Why can't we realize that there is a value in saying yes or no to Barrett Go? Because you, I got the door. I mean, what is a passport, after all, if it's not, comes to the French word, passer les 
passing the doors of Paris. You got the passport. So they can only come in if you say yes. Now, you're saying no today. What's that worth to Barrick? If something they've already put a billion five hundred thousand dollars, the first investment is going to be six billion. They're going to make easily over a hundred, a hundred and twenty billion. What's it worth to open the door? Now, how do you do that <coughs> without it being blackmail? How do you do that because it's value? How do you capture that value? Isn't that property? And then my intellectual friends in the United States coming around and say, Hernando. You're going down the wrong trail. It's a rabbit trail. My God, you keep it, it's a your old tradition. I got a friend who's Texan. He says, your old tradition is obviously the one of always building nests on the ground. Property is one thing and finance is another thing. And then, of course, I respect these people very much, so that puts me against the wall. I can't answer that. And I say, well, what have you got your categories wrong? What happens if maybe you as de Gaulle would say, les Anglo-Saxons, have decided that you're going to take this paper on the ground and call it property. And everything else that property can do, like become very liquid, you put in finance, and then you keep one from the other. And that's why you make these terrible mistakes, like uh, subprime. And then all of a sudden, whoa, there goes my financial market. Hey, maybe there's a little road between them that actually connects them, and all you're giving the same thing, which is trust, based on the only thing that doesn't move, which is land, a name here called land, and then a name there called money. But maybe it responds to one same social contract. And once you get that straight, uh, which you don't have to, the beautiful thing about common law is that Basically, it's a series of judges making decisions, da, 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 and it sort of streams together. And you don't have to explain anything except we're morally superior. <laughs> you Latin Americans may be white, but we're pink. You know, what is it that you can, how can you explain this kind of thing? And so we started saying, well, let's look to the people who know much more about financing than we do. Hey, blockchain. Hey, Bitcoin. I mean, maybe Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme because there's nothing really behind it except that it's limited. Hey, like land. Hey, like the boundaries. Now, what if we start creating a coin? Forget a coin, a token. A token that's got rules and laws that says very clearly an indigenous title, the ones they've made themselves in Peru, I mean, indigenous people in my country are a majority. I'm a minority. At least I think I am. We'll have to do a DNA one day. But that. And there, those titles tell you who's owns. It's a, they give you an identity. They give you a location, very precise. According to law established by the Spanish Congress, confirmed by the Republic, and the one that Barrick is going to have to negotiate with, because that's where they actually get the right to the surface. So these things work. They do tell you who's what according to rules that people are willing to die for on the surface. Now, if we get that information, they've got it in titles. They have got, they're not the same as the central ones. They've got it in, uh, in maps. What if we put all of that information in a token? And then we send what, and then the first backing we've got is not from the Peruvian banking sector. They're coming around now. But immediately, all the indigenous miners in Peru start saying, makes sense to us. Makes sense to us. Como se llama esa cosa? Blockchain, Ethereum. Makes sense to us. And what we do is this. And they say, but explain something more. Claro, hombre. I'm going to explain to you. Basically, what happens is when a foreign or even a local company buys the topsoil from you, they say, we're going to proceed according to Peruvian law. Very, very natural. What's the value of the land on the top? Well, there are records. The last one was sold for so much, I'll tell you, I'll put 30% more on it. So you get nada, which means very small amount of money for the land on the top.
But then the foreign company says, and I'll give you a little bit more than nada. So you got nada plus nada, all right? And then all of that goes into a bilateral, follows a bilateral investment treaty that was signed with the United States that says that this is the way you fill up your due diligence that goes to a law firm in the United States that then goes in and then gets the money. And then now you really see the face of the Western firm, the guys with the pink skin and the blue eyes and the blonde hair come in, take your girlfriends away and the value of their land goes whoom, and all the neighbors stay local and nada. Now, Marx could have told you that's alienation. He could have said it right away. I mean, what do you expect? That's what happens. So, of course, from their point of view, the question is the same one. Uh, I think that I saw a film of Rocky Stallone. I was gypped. I got screwed. And of course, maybe nobody wants screwed. It's just that one thing has bought a certain flight, and another thing, another. But what if you take a token? What if you take a token and say, these rights that you're not selling, because there is no indigenous organization to sell the rights. It's just one that's sealed. What they're buying is the land. You're actually having rights. And what all these other screening devices that you get in New York are saying, is that they're buying a right. Let's get it on token, put it abroad, anybody can buy it, and what's it worth? What is the key, le passeport, that opens the door to the gold of Peru, the oil of Nigeria, the oil of all the places you're fighting seven <laughs> wars together, what's it worth? And put it on the market. Now, I can, don't know, but I would bet it's worth an awful lot more. And that's what we're doing now. But for that, to do that, then you've got to start understanding, and to understand that you've got to go beyond the material. Now, I don't pretend to dictate a lesson, but this is what I was thinking when every ball of you were saying, but I got my land, I got this kind of thing. It's not the land. You see, the real thing is what Andre to say. Where are you, where are you Andre? So that I can, there you are. To tell you I was listening, there was trust in the thing. The thing is that what there is between Ayacucho, Cusco, Peru, right? Uh, between the Niger Delta and any for forlorn place in the world where all these valuable things are and where they, you will increasingly find that they are. And Wall Street is one long list of authentication. That's what it is. It's one long list of authentication. Forget when anybody told you, tells you this is a property right and this is finance, this is other stuff. No, it's the same thing. It is that we, to create a global economy, have basically created one authentication over another one. And you don't even realize it, you know. When you take out your credit card, you go out and pay the hotel, you're really putting in a bunch of authentications that are recognized back home and are also recognized at the hotel. That's what you're putting. It's not money that's passing, obviously. It's authentications of different ways. So what we're doing is figuring out how these authentications actually work, because they're not the result of big time planning. The result of finding out what it works if I'm going to put my visa card and get paid. But it is a stream. And once you get rid of the notion of property rights plus finance, you'll find out it's about trust and it's a system, and it works for 2.5 billion people in the world. Who are 2.5 billion people in the world? They're the westernized. I mean, you are obviously Western. I'm a Latin American, but I'm westernized too, right? Britney Spears, Bruno Mars, I'm westernized. Uh, and there are Arabs that are westernized, and Iranians were westernized. And, you know, dressed like you, and yesterday I was in a suit, and uh, Ricky. you said I reminded you of Vito Corleone, <laughs> right? So then I put on my jeans, so I remind you maybe of something else, somebody else. But I, whoever I am, I'm a Western guy, and you are a Westernized guy. Otherwise, how would it be that you were humming dun, 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 about Vito Corleone? I had a black suit and a white shirt, and he seen too many films. So, 
the general, the general idea here is the westernized world is in the system. What do we do about bringing the non-westernized world, which has got a lot of natural resources, and which has actually got more indigenous people than you North Americans have? How do we bring them in? And so the general, so basically, uh, this is a small, look, compared to Fidel Castro, this is peanuts. I'm sorry taking so much time. But really, what's behind this is that this country has got the technology, right, to make Bitcoin and all these things more than a Ponzi game in which some people can make money really fast. You've got to always have had this capacity, incredible capacity, to capture value. And now with the advance of your information technology, it's come to a point that is absolutely incredible because all the indicators to put into those coins are actually there. But that means something that's going to be very hard for your people to, uh, to understand and take on. It means the following thing, that every time you are taking a mission abroad and somebody says, look, there's land problems. Syria wants more of this, but Iraq wants more of that. Somebody says, in, send the surveyors in. Do you think it's really about the piece of land? Do you really think it's about the border? Or it's something underneath? Do you see, you know, or somebody will come in, wait a second, global positioning systems. I agree, it's all much better. But we had a skirmish with Ecuador. The press came in, and the Peruvian military came in as a GPS. It's obvious we're standing on Peruvian territory. Who are these messy guys coming from Ecuador? Ecuador came from the other side and said, no, look at our GPS. So you can cheat whichever way you go. It's not about measuring the land. It's about measuring the rights to the land. Oh, no, somebody will say, those are not rights. OK, they're not rights. Call them something else. Call them umpas. There are umpas there that can be read and screened and produce value elsewhere. And who else is going to benefit from this? You. You Americans. I mean, how does your Fed produce money? Your Fed basically, whatever you do, gold standard, gold points, whatever you do, when, when your mining company goes in, successfully makes a public offering, and the six billion bucks come out for the first investment, right? Somewhere in your Fed, nobody even knows about the deal because it's micro stuff. But somebody in your Fed says, um, look, uh, we need so much liquidity because it's in the statistics. If we put too much inflation, right? Too little deflation. So nobody thinks about the proven deal because it's one of thousands of deals. But that's coming in, and you issue money against it. So hey, you indigenous people of the Americas and of New Zealand, these pink guys are issuing money on the basis of resources that accordingly to treaties you own. So it's not only an issue of what you're going to get. They're making money on two bases. They're not only buying cheap real estate when basically they're just paying an additional little bit of a payment to get to the underground, their whole money stability system also depends on us. Now, what does that mean? I think what that really means is the following thing. You've got a bunch of treaties, right? Now, you've seen what happens with white man and treaties. You get the raw end of the deal, right? Well, you, let me tell you, you're going to get them with the Russians, you're going to get them with the Chinese, you're going to get them with the... Treaties are a bad idea compared to contracts. Contracts work. Treaties don't. The whole world is full of wars because treaties don't work. But you do have something there. Stop thinking about potatoes in the ground. Stop thinking about the corn in the ground. Stop thinking about your ancestors. That's historicism. What you want to do is start thinking about the future. You've got capital potential capital, or what I would have called dead capital. But to really get it going, you got to do what Andre Lassay said, you got to get institutions. You can't get around a table and say, white man has stolen my dignity. You can't do that. That happened. Gone. Bye. Finish. 
you know, the Spanish Armada destroyed my ancestors. What am I going to do? The Chileans won a war against Peru. What am I going to do? Finish. What you now have is value in your hands. And it has to do with law. And it has to do with the interpretation of law. And you've got a potential there that's enormous, that goes beyond what you can grow on it, and it goes beyond the buffalo. Now, how do I drive this to a, funny, to a good conclusion? I have no idea, because I probably just about insulted everybody. But the important thing is this. In this country, which I'm going to be visiting much more, you've gone into crypto, and you, as far as I'm concerned, you've opened a whole new world that hasn't to do with currency. It has to do with value. The word capital comes to the Latin word capere. Capisci? <laughs> capere. What does capere mean? It means how you seize something with your mind. Well, I, I suggested that Manny and, and uh, Hernando would carry on a conversation, and I'll enter in, too. I couldn't help just listening to this, thinking of the whole Excel pipeline issue in the United States as, as the tribes uh, stood there and said, no, we're not going to let this go across uh, the river. Uh, but it was really the same kind of issue you're talking about. Oh, yeah. Who had what rights? That's right. And, and to learn to work with the laws as they are. I mean, you're not about in the states to come to our system, which is, hey, the topsoil belongs to this and this. I mean, the law is there. It's tradition, right? Uh, it worked. First of all, at the beginning, there are no rights, right? There's litigation. There's fights. You know, at the beginning, we get together because there's a lot of wolves out there, so we've got to circle the wagons. And there's so many wolves and so many bears that we better get together. And after a while, uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we get into trouble. And all of a sudden, one day, we're not into trouble. Then it's a right. OK? So there's a lot of rights you're actually sitting I mean, there's nobody who's ever going to deny. I mean, every time I see an American film on uh, that has to do with indigenous people, there's a guy like Robert Redford with a gun on a horse sitting on a hill saying, this land ain't for sale. So that sunk in. That's law. It's not for sale, but maybe you can concession. I mean, there's other things. You've got to work with what is there, what's in place with the Security Exchange Commission. I think you're going to find there that you've got a lot of, a lot of capital, but you've got to look ahead and less in the retrovisor. How do you say it in the, the when, you, when you're driving the, the mirror that makes you? The rear view mirror? The rear view mirror. Ahead. You're the new generation. Man, one of the things that I've have always interested me, but going back to just your presence at the meeting today and last night, I'd like you to just kind of expound on what you heard and give us a little bit of advice on how we can begin to not look in the rearview mirror, but forward. Okay, it's very different in the case of, of Latin America and the countries that hire me. I'm in about 30 countries throughout the world. Okay, and in these countries, uh, shall we say, those who consider themselves indigenous are the majority. Here, you're a minority. Okay. Uh, so I would say that the strategy is different. I was asking yesterday some of our friends here, I said, well, how many are you? I got the thing, a reply of about uh, somewhere between 1 and 1.5 million. So you are a minority. All right. But a minority that is ever very present, obviously, because uh, the big people of the United States don't like to talk about it. Right? There's a guilt feeling there. So the idea is, how much you want to go dig into history, I find that there's a limit to that. When I came to Peru, and I was very ashamed of my ancestors, the conquistadors, um, I, uh, I started looking at this, and I felt I had a duty. And so I found out that before the Spanish consolidate their conquest, 70 years passed to set up Sevilla, the record-keeping system. And during that time, they set up a temporary system, which are los registros indios, but male, right? The male re registered, which basically to make sure that this new civilization that they've just conquered continues in peace. And so everybody records what they belong and what they're going to be uh, giving to their successors, right? And nobody's opened them.
because when Sevilla came in with Viceroy Toledo, it was a whole new ball game. So I said, has anybody ever opened these things? And Buddy said, no. So I went out, and I remember I got $10,000 from the Center for International Private Enterprise site. And uh, got a couple of Peruvian historians together and said, cut them open. So we cut them open. And the first, uh, uh, the first uh, will that came out was Don Diego Caqui. He was uh, a Curaca chief. He was a Quechua chief. And he willed 30 years after the Spanish conquest to his uh, sons and daughters 90 mules that did Lima to the Sierra and back, vineyards in Lima, and a winery. Those days, Peru produced great wine. We're starting to do it again. The Spanish forbade it 70 years later, but they produced the wine. And on top of that, three galleons that did trade, three galleons that did trade with Panama. And then the next one we found out was First of all, we had to find, get the church, get the priest to say it's okay and all that. But once, you know, the $10,000, we had already found Juan Nanasca, who had, obviously he was not as rich, but he had two galleons, bigger than the ones that Christopher Columbus came in, La Nina, La Pinta, or La Santa Maria. And he did trade. And 70 years later, there's no trace of all of these things. I then went to the newspapers and said, What's all this thing about? There's a famous book by Baudouin on the empire of the Incas. It's called El Imperio Socialista de los Incas, the Socialist Empire of the Incas. What's all of this stuff? Do we really know what went on there? I mean, this is what I've been hearing you guys talk about. You know, we trade it, we do this. These guys assimilated the Western thing of the galleon, took wood, and we're doing commerce. I mean, Panama didn't have a canal. I mean, that took Teddy Roosevelt to take away Colombian territory and cut, a la <laughs> cut, cut right through it. That was much later. But you, what you did is you disembarked the gold, you crossed it over, and you got another ship on the other side. And I p said, publish in the newspaper. Not one published. Because we've already decided what the past was. And that's when I took the decision to work in the present and look ahead. That's it. You see, you've got to decide. See, in the past, we've all been beaten up. I mean, somebody's conquered us. Somebody's given us a hard time. So the question is, yes. But the fact is, you know how proud you are. I mean, you know how proud you are. I mean, look at Manny did this. Every time I talk about it, he wears his hair his own way. He wears a hat his own way. He is all Kamloops. And I've been with your people and your First Nations. You are nations. There's no doubt you've got the identity. The question is this way. And build up. And what have you got? You've got paper. What kind of paper? When you've got a treaty, mm, peace treaties of the West, mm, but what you call jurisdictions is essentially the word of property. You've got property, fine. But then you have to find how it is that you played property on the market. And never forget, the paper does not reflect your relationship to the land. That's just a reference point. The paper is there for you to understand, communicate, discover value, capite, capital, discover value and capture it in a blip or in a piece of paper. And that, that piece of paper and how you write it up is much more important than the ground itself. And don't get the United States to all of a sudden send you surveyors. I mean, they're locked into this Jefferson thing. That was very important 300 years ago. It's all measured. It's all measured. Forget it. Okay, one inch here. Well, if you're Japanese, that counts a lot, whether you're going to have a waste paper basket in your apartment or not. But it's not about the measurement. It is about people tend to trust people who trust something, who trust something, and there's a web underneath it. And if you learn how to work in that web, all your talents will come to fruition, I would guess. But then I am very much a person who believes in private property, in the rule of law, and in capitalism. Because I think it's the most sophisticated thing that ever happened. So did Marx, by the way. 
One, one of the things I found fascinating when I visited you in, in Lima, and we went over to Terrapato and then Lemus, is, you know, everybody's got this impression of this incredible economist in, the, in this mind, but how did you, as me and Andre often talk about, how did you get here? You know, how did you end up, because you and I have something in common with doodling. Has art helped you? Because I noticed even in, in Lima, you designed your own house. Uh, you constantly are tinkering with it. It's a personal question. Yeah. No, I don't think it's that. I think that, I think, OK, this is an improvisation for I don't think it's that. I think it's a fact that I was always good at art. I lived from it for a while, like you. We have that in common. Very bad at maths. Yes. And so I had to find a logical way of getting in contact with the math mathematical world, which is figuring it out through the legal world. Yes. But uh, it's just coming to, re to realization that maybe the, math the guys on math were missing part of the game that can be substituted with some imagination. I guess that much more than that. Then, uh, <clears throat> then, uh, uh, then, of course, the reading of philosophy. You know, and uh, reading it in a different way. Mm -hmm. Reading it out of school. For example, one of the things that most fascinated me was a book by Aristotle. I forget what it was. It was a compendium of things that maybe his disciples wrote. But essentially, it was a mathematical formulation on where the end is, and I had to have it translated from someone who knew Old Greek, which was, which was uh, behind it, it was uh, the potential of something is always bigger than the thing itself. Mm -hmm. And he got to it through mathematics, and then you get to land. The potential that's in the land, it's not what you see. There's something else. That was one. There were a few, a few guys who impressed me. The other one was Alexis de Tocqueville who said something to this effect. I'm not, my memory always uh, works in a certain way. But he said, the, uh, the mother of all knowledge, way before Saddam Hussein, the mother of all knowledge is the knowledge of how to combine things. And Americans know how to combine things. In the, because you think of anything that there is in this room, right? Alone, nothing. I mean, even to, the, even to put this together, there's man hours, there's all sorts of things going on. The famous uh, American economist Mead, who wrote the history of a pencil, I pencil, what did it take to create me? The wood came from Oregon, the graphite came from Sri Lanka, the eraser came from Saudi Arabia. By the time he finishes giving his biography as a pencil, 17 nations. So what's important, if you want to there, is that the raw materials themselves I mean, talk about minerals, right? Mm -hmm. This watch has got 120 different stones and minerals. It takes 120, combining 120 stones and minerals. If you were just Peru and you got gold, you got nothing. Things work in the measure that they can be combined. And to be combined, they need a passport. They have to cross the surface, cross the boundary, cross, cross into the United States, and cross the places where they're going to be put together. They're going to be put together. So the important thing is, if we do not finish off globalizing the world, and it's something I only learned yesterday in conversation uh, uh, with, a, uh, with a friend, you know, if, we don't, if you don't do that, you know, whatever we have of international understanding will fall apart. But... But how do you settle this if not at a national scale? Because what international organizations are going to send you is geographers and mappers. And they're going to send you all the wrong people. It's a national problem. It's about nationality. It's about, it's about value. And, you're, and it's a good idea that the Hoover Institution uh, it's interesting. Imagine you were in a, working in a non-capitalist organization. We couldn't have had this conversation. Exactly. Are there some questions from the audience? I think there's a microphone, so hold on for it, if you will. 
Hernando and um, Annie, you both mentioned looking to the future, maybe employing technology and things that could assist in all of these things. And you mentioned, Hernando, the uh, blockchain, the distributed ledgers. And I wonder how you see that uh, new technology playing out to the benefit of the things you all have been discussing in a practical way. Thank you, sir. I, one day when I figure out what blockchain is, I'll be able to answer this much better. <laughs> <laughs> but basically what I see is there. It probably I came here to hear the answer. I came <laughs> You don't have it? Don't worry, amigo. I will make one up in five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the thing is that it's a ledger, it's a ledger system, right? It's a ledger system that is obviously, that obviously works. It's got a few concepts that I look at it, but in a different way. I like the idea, though I know that that's not what it's about, of the distributed ledgers. Because uh, I found out as uh, I was making um, fun of my girlfriend when she's all the time on Facebook. And, you know, it just bothers me. Look at the new poodle my friend has bought. I really don't care. <laughs> you know. I look at my daughters, how they're playing. Oh. All right. But then all of a sudden, I find out that of Peru, mainly indigenous population, 32 million, 20 million have got Facebook's account. And they're doing the same thing, but not with poodles. So then I say, tell myself, my God, let's find out if I can tell them to send their recordations to my institution, the recordations of property, because they They've got their own property organizations organized by law. In the old Spanish time, we didn't care what they did. So we gave them the rules, organized it, and they're now centrally plugged in. And with the first message I sent through Facebook, I got 2.5 million replies. That's when I said we can create a world record because obviously communication helps. So now the idea then is how do you the, to me, the distributed ledgers are what they've got there. That's one, that's one aspect that I like about, if you want to, uh, uh, the blockchain. Um, there is also the idea that there's a platform there, right, where you have to bring in different sorts of information, and our technicians have looked at it and said, okay, there's these kind of laws, there's this kind of law. Let, let me put it this way. In fact, and this is interesting, in fact, all people in the countries I work, say Peru, El Salvador, uh, wherever I work, in fact, we've signed so many treaties since, uh, um, since uh, the 1948, when we started getting our act together after the Second World War, and since 1989, that it give everybody property rights. They all have the right to property rights. There isn't a bilateral investment treaty that we signed with the United States, with France, with whoever it is. A free trade agreement that doesn't have those principles. So if you think of Peruvian law, or any one of our developing countries' law, everything that is necessary to warrant everybody having laws is in place. It's just that it will take 150 years before it actually trickles down into a manual that keeps that guidance. Right? Because the law in Peru says we are all equal in front of the law, and yet you don't have the right of a mining company. Oh, yes, you do. You have the best lawyer in town, but you don't. You're going to have to wait, like uh, Americans of African uh, descent, 100 years after Jefferson, for Lincoln to start doing something about something which was their right 100 years ago. And you're going to have to wait another 100 years until Kennedy sent somebody to Alabama to make sure you can ride in the front of the bus and not in the back of the bus. It takes time, unless you focus. Unless you realize that it's not just a right-wing word. It means something for everybody. So one of the advantages, if you want to, of the, uh, of the, of the system is that what you've got to do is be able to track those laws and bring it in right away. You don't have to change anything. You don't have to ask government anything. Our plan is we don't ask government for everything. Here's this person that's poor, that's indigenous, or whatever it is. Here's his title. Yeah, but I don't know. Here are the 10 additional laws you need to know. They're in there. We put them in together. The platform of blockchain or Ethereum can do that. In principle, we think. 
not only principle, in theory. Theory is tested hypothesis. So I like that about, uh, I like about the system. What don't I like about it? What I don't like about it is the fact that it's peer-to-peer. -peer. That impresses me less. Why? Am I against that? No. Because I'm a westernized guy, so I do have things I want to deal with secretly. But the problem with indigenous people is that the world has got to know that they own the goddamn place. So you don't want that privacy. You want the publicity. So you take that away. So, okay. So it's a little bit like we like your technology. It's like we like your hamburgers in Peru, for example. We love your hamburgers in Peru. We like your frankfurters. But not that sweet sauce that you come with it. We put a little bit of more chili, a little bit of more this and that. Blockchain with a local color. You've got, it's, it's all there, I think. It's all there. And all the contraptions that are necessary to capture it are also there. We've tested them. So uh, it should be, a, it should, it should be, that should happen in the next two years, I believe, in the next three years if, uh, if we're patient. I have to say, that was pretty good improv. I'm a, I now know what it means. But Another I question, perhaps. It, one of the, you know, like, one of the things I always find fascinating about uh, thinking is, uh, you know, some of the ultimate questions. And, and one of the things that I've always thought about is, ultimately, what do we want to be? You know, and where do we fit? Have you given that any thought? Because ultimately, you've thought about it because you've written the book on the mystery of capital, and where does that lead us? The mystery of capital was not written with an idea of where he would read of it. What Mr. Capital simply wanted to do is tell the non-Westernized <laughs> world, and part of the Westernized world, that this is the best we've got so far, mm -hmm. okay? And make a distinction between capitalism and mercantilism which is the use of the cap of the, the use of the cap uh, of of the state by the capitalist right but that there was and that the value is a very sophisticated thing i also wanted to put out that marx probably figured out a bunch of things better than he did that adam smith not only wrote and had wrote with an invisible right hand he also wrote with an invisible left hand because there was uh, i think it's called the theory of moral sentiments and that some people two centuries, three centuries ago saw the whole thing and just put it in modern terms, right? Uh, but I'm not too sure. I mean, I'm as one grows uh, as one grows older, right? And uh, I'm now thinking of buying a house in Peru, facing the sea. Uh, the purpose of which is uh, hopefully, if death doesn't come painfully, it's a condition. The idea is to look at the sea. And then just at the moment of the last breath, I said, ask, what was this all about, really? Yeah. And uh, I don't really know. All I know is it has meaning, right? Yeah. It has meaning. But I don't know what's behind it. I mean, if somebody's doing the arch... Uh, the uncle of mine said, somebody's doing the architecture. I mean, if there's an order, in Spanish, we say, hay orden, hay un ordenador. If there's order, somebody's putting that order. I mean, why do the seeds fall this way in that tree? Why do, you know, why do you sneeze when you sneeze? I mean, somebody, something is putting this together. The good things and the bad things. That's why I'm not too sure I want to find out. But <laughs> wait for the moment to come. That was a deep question. I have to, and I don't have a deep reply. Uh, Keep an open mind. Okay. If, if no other questions, uh, join me in thanking Hernando for uh, his comments. Thank you.